going to unshare for just a moment. And <clears throat> just share my window with some slides. Uh, if you're um, if you want to follow along. There are a few things that. Uh, that um, can be participated in today a little bit later on, but there's the link to the schedule and you can follow along with the slides or the um, a, a page of prompts that will come to you and even some uh, R code and data that we can play with a little bit later. But primarily I'm going to demonstrate the R code and then we're going to attempt to coax um, ChatGPT to uh, reproduce the analysis in my R code. I'm going to demonstrate my R code and then I'm going to demonstrate some prompts and we'll have a little activity to write our own prompts to get some sensible R code. OK. So first of all, I'm going to share and I've got a few slides to go through. <clears throat> I accidentally closed my folder and now I have to navigate through them through the depths of my computer. Here we go. There we go, it's looking good. Just going to, I'm not going to put it in talk mode today because I have trouble running Teams at the same time as PowerPoint in talk mode. So I'm just gonna do it like this. Um, I'll make this smaller so we can get the maximum uh, picture. There we go. OK, so um, as you know, I'm, I've been experimenting and very excited by uh, ChatGPT. Had this idea, I, I see that there's a bit of an internet meme that has come up in the data science world um, where I'll, I'll, I've been seeing lots of tweets and a, a, just a, a really, really huge amount of um, YouTube videos and blog posts, LinkedIn posts. And the, the meme that has come up uh, amongst, um, I don't know, academic data scientists, and, and actually I, I think normal people who are interested in data, is they refer to this, this proliferation of um, clickbaity um, chat GPT stuff that, that is just coming out all the time as, um, as AI bros. So the AI bros will, will make a post like um, uh, there's statisticians uh, are going to be replaced by chat GPT or um, do we ever need to write code again or is it the end of jobs uh, or the top 10 ways for um, chat GPT to analyze your code and on and on and on. <clears throat> and uh, I am interested in chat GPT as a tool to do exactly that and to do exactly the kind of things that Matt was just talking about. Um, it's it's so exciting as a solution, but I feel a little bit like I'm being flooded by uh, bad information from the AI bros. So I'm going to give you my take on that in my own words today, and then we'll have an activity about essentially how I believe every person in this room, including myself, can uh, use ChatGPT to be more efficient, more productive, and and to learn. Um, even me, I'm talking about with the learning part to learn different ways, uh, better ways, more efficient ways of uh, of using the tools that we have. I think that is uh, an immediate benefit of GPT. All right, the, I have a couple of things that I wanted to say, just even since last week, um, that are developments in the large language model world. There have been a lot of them. So in the style of a chat, uh, an AI bro, um, I've got you know two things you can't miss from the last week. Um, the first one is that <clears throat> the company behind ChatGPT, OpenAI, announced that uh, web searching would be enabled uh, as a as a mode within which um, you could use GPT-4. Now uh, you recall from last week that um, that um, Google Bard is more up to date than ChatGPT, 
and that it does have web searching enabled and it, and it works reasonably well. Um, so this is a this is big news for OpenAI and ChatGPT. But I found out immediately that it um, it actually does not work very well at all. Uh, I don't know why that is. It may be that um, some of the search engines or or other um, sources have restricted calls from OpenAI. I, I would, if I were Google, I would definitely restrict API calls from uh, ChatGPT or GPT-4 to my website because it's costing me money and also taking away from my own efforts. Uh, so I think this will probably be solved uh, eventually by um, by plugins, but it's not working yet. Another thing was that uh, remember OpenAI is uh, heavily funded by Microsoft, and um, <clears throat> they did announce <clears throat> uh, right on the coattails of announcing that web searching was part of it is that the Microsoft native uh, search engine Bing now. Uh, Bing, here's my take on Bing. Most people, I don't know if any of you have used Bing or do use Bing. I don't want to hurt your feelings with what I'm about to say if you if you do know, love, and use Bing. But it's essentially been the laughing stock of the internet for about 20 years since it came out. I mean, it, it performs pathetically slowly. It gives weird results, and it gives very biased commercial results, obviously biased towards Microsoft. That's my view over 20 years of using it. You'd be uh, a fool, really, not to use anything other than Bing, really. Um, and, and Google has, of course, taken over the world because their browser is is just so good. Uh, so that may be about to change. Again, I'm, risk, I'm risking uh, heading into, um, into AI bro territory here with this um, Nostradamus-like pronouncement that uh, if Microsoft, who has access to the API for uh, GPT-4, can successfully integrate it into their web browser, um, nobody is going to want to use Google anymore. I'm not going to want to use Google anymore. I'm going to want to start using Bing and be able to access GPT-4 for free. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. I was anxious to try to use that for today. Uh, this afternoon, but it's not available in the UK at this time, uh, at least on my research account. Now, I mentioned uh, last time <clears throat> just a, a little bit about what large language models were with almost no detail, and here's slightly more than almost no detail. Some of you have talked to me uh, and been in classes with me when we've been talking about neural networks. And we know that at the at the core of large language models is a neural network framework. And uh, we can think of neural networks this a uh, way that I do think of them. I, I kind of can't help but to think of them this way is they're they're like a very complicated statistical model. Now, they we hear in the news a lot in the popular media that um, that they are designed to work somewhat akin to how the human brain works. That, that's an uneasy thing for me and other people because the history of this research led by Jeff Hinton and lots of other people has been that the, um, they, they used as a metaphor uh, neuronal connections or neural networks, hence the name neural networks. But in, in actuality, they work um, you know, nothing like we know the, the brain works, but we still have that, that metaphor. It's an OK metaphor because it works on some levels until you look at any any detail whatsoever. But at that aside, uh, this little cartoon down here is uh, something that we can just consider to be a statistical model or that metaphorical um, brain. All right. For a large language model and. Uh, this part of the uh, the model has been trained on. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, I may or may not have a slide that that sort of tips this, but um, on a, a very very large amount of uh, of training data. Um, what do I mean by very large? I mean very 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 large. I mean. Uh, 
if we think of uh, mentioned that jargon term tokens last time, but we can more or less think of tokens like human words or uh, words in any language. If I say a very, very, very large training set, I mean something akin to all the words in all the books that have ever been written. I mean something akin to uh, trillions and trillions. I think it's something like 35 trillion words. And if you think of things like a really, really long novel has about 50,000 words ish. Uh, a really long scientific paper has about 8,000 words. Um, you know, a whole library has, has 20,000 books. You can do a few back of the envelope calculations to uh, work out that this is a lot of text. It's not only books, though. It's uh, it's people, things that people write in blogs. It's um, medical textbooks. It is um, uh, thousands and thousands of hours of uh, customer service um, text from uh, recordings. It's all sorts of sources. It's it's uh, really astonishing. Now that part has already been done for you, and this is the power of the large language model. What OpenAI have done is they've been funded to do all that training and set their model up so that you can prompt the model. Now uh, the the prompts for the model are very small at the moment. It's one of the primary bottlenecks that keep this system. It's where all the AI bros are talking about, and uh, everyone is scrambling to figure out ways to take small amounts of text to prompt and contextualize these models to um, to codify their output into something useful and creating pipelines to do so quickly. Uh, so we can think of this this framework for the training down here as uh, as a set of model weights that we now refer to as the large language model. And it's the prompts that we design to uh, to give to the algorithm that um, comes out with the interesting part, the output. Um, and the the kinds of things we're outputting are we could roughly categorize them into um, text or computer code uh, or other forms of automation. Um, I've mentioned a few names, and maybe we'll come around to um, some of these tools in the future. So I'm very excited about them, um, like uh, the Auto GPT and like um, the Langchain. Okay, I have some slides at the end of this, but I don't think we'll get to them today. Today, I'm going to focus on this code part, the interesting part. And there are some caveats, like uh, Matt brought up. He and I were talking about it. Um, the other day, but I have a particular viewpoint on this that um, has to do with this model. This is my own model of what I would call the practice of statistics, the practice of statistics. So the practice is comprised of some subject knowledge. You have to be some, you have to have some expertise in order to formulate uh, a question or in order to appreciate the answer to some question. You have to have some context, some subject knowledge. You have to have data um, to, to primarily design the collection of data, sensible data. You know, it's contingent on that subject knowledge and, and maybe also some statistics expertise, whether that's you or with a collaborator. But um, when, when I'm thinking about teaching and consulting on solving statistics problems with data. Um, this part usually is is already in place, uh, almost always. I'm, I'm rarely consulted or I rarely um, uh, have worked where um, the data wasn't already collected or the design for the data collection wasn't already there. And so most of uh, stuff that I do and that all other people like me do or that you may do as a, a data scientist will be to um, to accrue uh, knowledge of software tools. Now, they could be any kind of software tools. It could be R, SAS, Python, Genstat, SPSS, anything in there. Uh, and also knowledge of uh, how to apply statistics 
statistics, assumptions, what techniques fit, what kind of questions and data, uh, and so forth. Now, uh, most for most people, this just takes uh, takes a little bit of training, and then it takes experience solving your own problems or or helping people solve problems. Okay, and um, when people come in to a um, to an applied program like the data science course here, or or indeed every PhD project uh, or master's project is an applied project by necessity. Um, it's it's this part that is gentler to accrue over a short period of time, but th this part over here is the shocking part. You don't have much time. It's all uh, it's all new to most people when they begin, and uh, um, it's a it's a steep row to hoe. Well, um, I I get this this phenomenon when people come into uh, a lot of the classes that I teach. I exclude the data science classes because people choose to come in there and they know they have an idea of what they're in for. They, they choose to be uh, uh, workers in data, so they come into that. But for students that just want to learn to analyze data to answer a subject specific question, this part, this programming part with the software it's often very difficult for them. It's a shocker uh, when I ask them to to learn R. They know that they have to take and learn some statistics. They know they even can articulate the usefulness of it, but learning the tools here is a shocker. So it's a, there's a behavioral challenge here of people accepting that they they would have to learn both the tool and the technique. Okay. It's also a practical challenge. It's it's horrendous. Uh, for, I've heard that and so so much more, um, Amy. Uh, the challenge of, of that's the challenge. Maybe one of the challenges of learning it. Um, there is a challenge of teaching it. Is that um, people? I, I kind of joke about the stages of mourning, but I, I view it as a serious problem, and I, I do uh, take it very seriously in the terms of trying to help students uh, overcome the shock and overcome the uh, the challenges they have. I've had some extreme complaints before. The very first time, some of you have heard me tell this anecdote before, very first time, literally the first day that I ever taught here at Harper Adams was in a large statistics class. There were about 60 master students in there. And I said, right, guys, we're going to we're going to learn how to um, make this graph in R today, and then I'll tell you what it's all about later. And um, I demonstrated it and uh, just wanted to see that everybody could use open the software successfully, really. Um, and a young person stood up in the class, raised their hand, stood out of their chair, and pronounced this. This is almost a direct quote. Uh, you know, I'm milk cows for a living. Why are you teaching me to, you know, computer programming? And uh, I I caught on the spot. It was hard for me to think of something that wasn't rude to respond to. You know, why why are why are you if you're a cow milker, why are you doing a master's degree in science? Uh, that's what jumped into mind. But but really, this person was just reacting. They were surprised and they were scared. Well, um, <clears throat> as it transpires, ChatGPT uh, could solve a problem that I've, I have thought about my entire career. I, I have, on the one hand, using programmatic software. As you know, I'm very passionate about this. It's best practice. It confers employability skills to students. Uh, everybody wants a, a, an employee, if, they, if there's a, they have a data relevant role. They want a PhD student, a postdoc, a colleague, or an employee. Everybody wants someone who's who's armed with uh, best practice tools and can solve these kinds of problems. For the first time in my career, I see a, a solution that is palatable. Uh, I believe that uh, ChatGPT can actually really help the learning curve for uh, learning software. It not only solves the problem, if you you still will have to learn to use ChatGPT 
T, this is a little foreshadowing for our exercise in a little while, but um, it, it's actually also a great way to learn how to code. Uh, again, Matt, I hope you don't mind that I, I mentioned our conversation when we were having that lovely walk along the canal that you led us on this weekend, where we were talking about our own experiments with ChatGPT and how uh, it was so fun to see the algorithm produce different solutions than ones we might make ourselves for, for wildly different problems. I might be doing statistical programming. Matt might be doing some computer vision programming. It's just fun. And we learn, you can learn so easily. And I would even suggest, I'll, I'll demonstrate this as well, that uh, one of the things, as you know, I teach the students uh, in my classes is um, not just doing statistics, not just the practice of the techniques, but also reporting the statistics, what they mean. I think the chat GPT and, and other future large language models. Remember, GPT-4 is, is just the latest large language model. And you know every company is scrambling to make it better, and they will make it better. Uh, and very soon, I can't wait to see what happens next week. So I'm going to go through um, an example here. Let me see what's on my next one. I'll go through the example first, and then I'll go to the activity. Um, I'm going to um, to uh, uh, bring up the website. Now, if you want to follow along with this, you don't need to. And in, in fact, if it's a distraction for you to follow along with this, I'd recommend paying attention to what I say, and then we'll focus on our activity in just a little bit. But I have put a project zip file here. You can just unzip it and open the project file and it will prompt you. And you could follow along with me. I'm going to explain my own code in my own words. This is code that I wrote um, in, in this file. So you would unzip it in a folder like this and just open the project file like that in R. So I'm just going to do that, open R. Now I'll, I'll um, make the text a little bit bigger, as I like to do, and I'll arrange my screen. Before we do anything, I want to tell you a story about the experiment. And to do that, I'm just going to open up the, uh, the data sheet here. I'm only going to say this verbally. I don't have a um, I don't have a long explanation of uh, of, of this. I've recently updated my um, Microsoft Office with all the apps, and um, it's behaving funny, so I'm still getting used to it. So uh, recently, uh, as, as you know, one of my roles at the university is to um, build capacity in uh, my colleagues and and research students. And uh, most of the time I, I do do this with uh, with PhD students and sometimes master's students too. And, and of course the teaching in my own research. This project came to me in the form of um, some capacity building for the colleague. Okay, so there's a an experiment going on here. I'm not, I don't need to give you a lot of details, and, and I'm not going to give you all the details of it. Um, not that it's not that it's a secret or anything, but I'll, I'll just give you the details we need for our exercise here. This was an experiment looking at cows. We have a column cow IDs. Um, there were several cohorts of uh, cows in this experiment, so um, you know we can see here that there were four individual cows in the uh, cohort one called allocation. There, each cow had a days post calving. We know that um, number of days since calving affects the onset of milk in mammals. There was a treatment. We don't even need to talk about what the treatments are. There were three feed treatments. Um, there was a parity experiment. We also know one of the things that um, affects milk production is how many calves the uh, the cow has had before. These are just categorized. I think zero had 
up to about two previous calves and one had had more than two. So it was something like that. Um, previous yield is, a, uh, I think it's the, the previous weeks or period of times yield of milk in liters. And then there are these ten, uh, 11 actually weekly measures. This is the average daily milk yield for each particular week. Okay, and we can see that each cow, in this case, I've just highlighted this row. I'll make this just a little bit bigger. I don't wanna make it too big because the weeks run off, but this cow, number 4559, had uh, on week one, a uh, week zero, had 44.3 liters on average per day, week one, 50.3 liters on average per day, and so forth. So this is kind of a classic repeated measures experiment. And statisticians usually call this kind of data um, the wide format for repeated measures. And, and, it, and it's not explicitly not in tidy format because we know that every independent measurement must be on a row. So to make this into tidy data format, um, we would convert this to what statisticians call the long format. So we would make a two new columns, <clears throat> uh, one for week, and the week the weeks go from zero to ten. So on each row there would be the numbers, you know, zero up to ten. And then an, a new column for yield, the average daily milk yield. Okay, and it would it would have many more rows. Um, so there are um, here there are, are one there's one row per cow. It's 45 rows, so it's 46 row 46, not including the header. Um, so there would be uh, we know there are 11 columns of milk yield, so there would be 45 times 11 rows in the new data set. OK, so that that would be just the thing I'm thinking of. Another thing to point out here is that there are a couple of um, cows that have missing data. Because we have repeated measures, uh, like an old fashioned way of analyzing a data set like this would be repeated measures ANOVA. If you have a perfectly balanced design and no missing data, there's no reason not to use repeated measures ANOVA. It is a bit old fashioned. Most people would probably do a linear mixed effects model for these data. But if there were no missing data, um, and if there were exactly balanced um, numbers across the experiment, there's no reason not to do repeated measures ANOVA. It's perfectly adequate. Here, though, we do have missing data, and we do not have perfectly balanced data across all the different factors. Ones we're going to focus on in this is we know there's an effect of weak um, in this experiment, and partly because uh, we know there's an increase in milk yield a little bit in days post calving. We're obviously interested in the feed treatment. That's the whole point of this whole thing. And um, we're also going to look at the uh, whether or not the allocation matters. Okay, this. So somebody brought me this data set. They said. Have a few questions about it, and how would you do this? What's a you know modern way to do this? And I've got the missing data and all that. So that was the the task that was beset me. Part of the task was to analyze the data. It's quite a simple data set, so it's very easy to analyze this. Very straightforward. Part of it was to um, demonstrate best practice and talk about the pros and cons. Okay. So I want to use this as an example. I want to show you quickly my analysis. I don't want to use all of our time. So um, I, I quickly um, will load up the usual suspects for me. And Open Excel is my preferred Excel reader. LME4 and LMER uh, test are two that I've used many times in here. They always go into a mixed effects um, script for me. Bizreg, you know, is one of my favorite statistical, um, especially for mixed effects, but also for for uh, plain old general linear models, um, way to visualize statistical effects. It's a little bit different than graphing the raw data. Um, we've talked about it a little bit before in here, but it goes in every script that I write. Tidyverse, oh, you may be surprised that Ed's using the Tidyverse because I always besmirch it when I'm talking to you. 
but sometimes it has its uses and it, and it does in this. I'll tell you why and when. And ggplot2, again, you may be surprised. I do prefer base R, but I've been using ggplot sometimes. So uh, for this one, I, I did it this way. So I read in the data, uh, 321. Oops, I've got to actually read in the libraries. 321, boom, there we go. Here they are, reading in the data, 321. Got it. Got our 17 um, columns. Now we don't want that. So I've written this little stretch of code that uh, that converts the data set to uh, long format. I've used the pivot longer. So that's why I'm using the tidyverse um, um, to do that. I could do it manually, but actually it turns out tidyverse and pivot longer or, or um, pivot shorter. Um, are much less code and just they are tidier than the way that I would do it natively. So I've started using it. And then I've converted a few of the variables to factors and then I'm removing the original data set because I don't need it anymore. I could have just overwritten it here, but I just wanted to keep in mind that I made it um, the long version. Okay, so three, two, one. So now I've got a new data object, data L. It's got um, eight variables. 495 observations. Okay, made a few diagnostic graphs. Um, the first one is uh, looking at the treatment. It's going to pop up down in the grass window now. Three, two, one. Look, there's a lot of variation. I don't see a strong treatment effect. There's a lot of variation. You know, something could be happening with a reduction in milk yield uh, for three, but it's not clear. Wanted to look at the individual cow contribution of variation. There's a line for every cow across weeks on the x-axis and the uh, weekly average daily yield on the y-axis. And um, you see there's just an awful lot of variation due to cow. Some cows are strong milkers, other cows, and they consistently so, really high milkers and others are really low and a lot in the middle. And the the lines are very parallel, um, and some are going all over the place. Okay, so I'm going to look at the treatment effect, three, two, one. This is just going to color the individual lines. Um, it's hard to see. It's red, green, blue, so apologies for the colorblind that may be with us. But uh, the red treatment one spans the whole thing, just like we saw in the box plot, and the other two the green and the blue for treatments two and three are almost completely entwined with one another in the middle. Again, just, just reflects a little more detail from the box plot. I want to look at the parity. This one's really confusing. I'm not going to linger on it. I just wanted to have a look at it. It does look like there's an effect of parity. The red lines are a bit lower than the um, blue lines on average. The allocation, this one's stupid. This is. I should have just taken out this graph because there are so many cohorts, uh, but I made it anyway. All right, the stats for this. Um, I didn't do any model building because, uh, as you know, model model selection is uh, one of the modern tools that everybody everybody encounters. I, I observe that applied scientists, it's a challenge to philosophically um, justify model selection with experimental design. So if you design an experiment to answer a set of questions with factors that you measure, you should never do any model selection. But if you Google around the web to find a, sol a solution for analyzing stuff, model selection is absolutely everywhere. It's really popular. So um, I didn't really do much model selection here until I sat with it in conversation with uh, my colleague. But what I did do is I made a linear mixed effects model with yield as the dependent variable, treatment week and parity as um, fixed effects, and cow as a random effect. Data are my long data set. I've used RIML here. I've, express, I've expressly um, set the, the default value of, of RIML. This is um, reduced error maximum likelihood was invented by an almost unknown statistician named R.A. Fisher. I'm joking, he's the most famous statistician, and, I, and I'm a big fan of his work. Um, the default for Rimmel 
for generalized linear models and mixed effects models it is to use reduced error maximum likelihood to um, one of the things it does is that allows us an unbiased estimate of missing missing data. So it's it's just the default. It's very robust. I explicitly did it true here because um, that was one of the um, the queries that that my colleague was interested in. And as an aside, in model selection, um, Rimmel biases the the components of variance, so we can't use Rimmel if we are using model selection. So we would have to use plain maximum likelihood, set Rimmel to false, do model selection, and then for the final model, go back to Rimmel. So this is all part of that statistics knowledge uh, that you it takes people a while to accrue. And it's part of normal practice. So I'm going to go ahead and run this model. Three, two, one. And I'm not going to pussyfoot around. I'm just going to um, do the ANOVA table output. It'll pop up in the console. Three, two, one. What we see, not surprisingly, I'm, I'm going to go through the um, treatment effect. It's not significant. Let's just look at the vis reg. Three, two, one. So there's a lot of variation around these. Now, these are corrected means corrected for the individual cows. It's one of the reasons I like this red, Jim. It's just the um, the corrected model outputs rather than the raw data. Uh, of course, we've covered this a number of times in here. We could see there's too much variation to resolve any possible effect. For parity, um, we see the parity result. There is uh, a significant effect. It's not, it's not hugely strong, but it's um, respectable. So let's look at the parity effect, three, two, one. So we did see that in the line graphs that parity zero had a little bit lower yield. What kind of lower yield? Well, we could see that the uh, predicted baseline is just a bit more than 35 liters, and it's like 38 or 39 for the ones um, at parity set to one. So it's pretty respectable effect size. Weak has a huge effect, really strong. Look at that. It's just an astonishing F value relative to the others. Let's just have a look at how that looks. Three, two, one. Okay, not surprising. So we also noticed that in the individual cows. All right, I did do a little model selection um, where I dropped the parity value. Again, this not not because we exported it, but for a for a conceptual reason with the colleague. I'll just run those two. Run the AIC. We can see the AIC the model that contained parity is much lower. Um, and uh, but there's not that much in it. I said much lower. It's a few points lower. This this uh, AIC value doesn't it, it has a arbitrary scale. So usually what we do is an ANOVA test to see if the two models are different. P value less than five means that they are different and we would probably um, accept the magnitude of difference of AIC um, for the calculation of being significant. We have to pay attention to it. Three, two, one. We see that the models are indeed different. All right. Now this is an entire analysis that I did. I did it quite quickly. You know, I, I, I was sent the data. I did this before I even met with the person. And most of our discussion was what it all means and trying a few little variations and explaining Rimmel and explaining um, the model selection and stuff like that. I did an experiment. I'm, I'm worried that I've talked so long. We only have 15 minutes left and we don't have time for our exercise. So what I think I'm going to suggest is that I'm going to show you my prompt. But um, before you run my prompt, I'll demonstrate my prompt as well. Before you run my prompt, um, do your own experiments. And I recommend that every person do this experiment. I, 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 uh, I haven't quite formulated the way that I will use this when I teach in the future. The one thing that I do know is that I will be using this to teach with, and I will be using this for all of the statistical consulting I do in, in the future um, in my own practice of statistics, because it's, it's a real game changer. So I'm going to demonstrate my prompts. We go back to the slides. <clears throat> Um, uh, the activity I, I thought 
I thought it was unlikely we would have time for it. And as it transpires, we, we don't really have time for it. But it was like this. I encourage you all to do it outside of the session. And if you have anything funny, interesting, frustrating, maybe we could take it to Slack um, after today. But I intend everybody to use the um, the free chat GPT playground uh, link here. Now this one is at the moment it is um, a GPT model, a large language model. It's been out for about six months. Uh, it's GPT three, uh, and it may even be GPT three point five. I just can't remember. And you have an option there uh, in the playground to pick older models. Uh, and by older, it doesn't necessarily mean they're bad, but it does mean that they're smaller and they run faster. And they may be perfectly adequate for some for some applications. I, I did do some experiments I'm not going to talk to you about today, where I compared the results between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, and the prompt that I'm about to show you. And uh, GPT 4 is significantly better, but it's slower <laughs> at at uh, making good code. Okay. So here's the, the activity. Um, I would like you, I will demonstrate and talk you through my prompt, tell you how I came to this prompt. But uh, I think it would be, if you're interested, if you have the few minutes, I think it would be interesting. And I would love to hear your experience for you to write a prompt that enables ChatGPT to help you to write code to analyze that data that I just showed you. Walked you through the whole analysis, you know it's a mixed effects model. I'd walk you through the whole data set. There's a little bit of a data dictionary in there. You can familiarize yourself with it. And I go ahead and I give you a human language version of the R formula. So you're analyzing essentially milk yield as a function of treatment, weak, and parity as um, fixed effects, and cow as a random effect. Okay, so remember you have to convert the data to long format first, and then you have to um, formulate the uh, the results. And another little thing I didn't say verbally was that some of you, many of you <laughs> who have had data with mixed effects models have gone through this with me, where you'll, you'll have a mixed effects problem. And I explain uh, I, I like explaining this because I think it's important for applied scientists to know that most um, most statisticians, I, I believe this as well um, I, in my own practice, but most some some statisticians are much more zealous about how they feel other people should behave and and execute their statistics practice. I'm very much more of a humanist statistician. <laughs> I, I think that there's room for all sorts of opinions in this world. And we should discuss things. Some statisticians believe that um, that we should not be using p-values anymore in this world in our practice of statistics. Some statisticians believe, and by the way, Sophie, loved your tweet about this exact thing. Uh, some statisticians believe we should be interpreting effect sizes and the error around the estimates that we make in our statistical analysis. For that reason, the some of the smartest, most productive, and, and generally recognized as the best applied statisticians in the world have invented and created and shared with the rest of the world the LME4 model. And that model does not give you p-values. If you want them, you have to calculate them yourself, they argue. But someone else, someone gentler, a little bit more like myself, uh, invented the LMER test package that gives you your p-values back. So we have to keep that in mind too. I, I just did all of that. I didn't mention it when I did it. So I want to show you my prompt that can be used to reproduce my my results there. I'm going to make this big. And um, I'm, I'm going to skip this one. But uh, I was going to give it my R code. You can play with this. Um, one of the things that I think is just a scream is uh, you can ask ChatGPT to add comments and to format your code. Uh, 
I have a series of experiments. I don't want to get too uh, too off on a tangent on this. But uh, what what if you're you are sharing your code with your supervisor or or someone else? You could specify that in your prompt and um, tailor the comments to that that other receiver. Okay. But what I really wanted to do was to recreate the analysis that I did do. Take some statistical knowledge to do this. But I just wanted to see how far I could take this. So uh, I wanted to set the stage. It took me about, um, I knew I would need some good detail in the prompt to be able to reproduce essentially my whole analysis. Um, I didn't know exactly how much, and it took a little bit more detail than I thought. So I want to show you the bulk of it. If I make it zoom out just a little bit. So uh, it took me this much prompting to reproduce my entire experiment. And it took me about, I'd say about a, I wasn't trying to go fast when I wrote that script, but it takes me about 20 to 30 minutes to write a script like that. That includes the basic graphs that I wrote. And it took me about five minutes to type this part. So even for someone with a lot of experience, I I can write, I can get usable code. And I'll, I hope we get usable code when I run the prompt afresh here. I can work a lot faster. It takes a little skill. So here's what I wrote. I said, listen, I'd write, like you to write some R code for me. You have to tell it the language. I have an experiment with several variables. I said, listen, the data are in a file called milk underscore yield XLSX. Data dot uh, data large L are the is the data object. I've gone through each of the well, this is basically just the data dictionary. Cow, cow ID as a factor, allocation, different groups of factor, D post calf, days post calving, count of days, treat the experimental treatment of factor, parity. Category, uh, category of calving events, a factor, pre-yield, a covariate, the amount of milk yield in previous days, week underscore zero to week underscore 10, different weeks measuring the average daily milk yield in liters. I think this is kind of amazing. It's inferring that um, nine other week columns. Now, I didn't know this would work, um, but this is what I was able to pare down to. I, I, tried some more verbose versions of this, and I had to add quite a lot of detail to get it to this stage. Data are in wide. Remember, uh, I say I had to add a lot of detail. It took me about five minutes, so it wasn't an arduous thing. Data are in wide format. I'd like the data to be converted into long format with one column for week as an order factor 0 to 10 and yield as a numeric column. There is some missing data for a few cows. Uh, I found that um, found that uh, I probably could take this out, but it, I left it in. I want to run a linear mixed effects model using the R packages LME4 and LMER test. It's my own preference and experience. I'd recommend almost everybody to use this. One thing that I see that um, R Studio, I mean the ChatGPT is good at doing, is coming up with really creative different ways, and it's really fun. I can learn a lot of stuff. On the other hand, if you want to just get down to it, you have to have some standards. And having consistent code with a consistent prompt, you know, you could recycle this and get similar comparable results every time. Yield is the dependent variable, explanatory variables, treatment, parity, and weak. Write a script that analyzes the data, makes univariate graphs for the explanatory variables. I am interested in p-values for the main effects in an ANOVA table, i.e. not a contrast table from the summary function. That's the way we get the contrast table, as you know, of explanatory variables and also the amount of variation explained by the random effect. I want the proportion of variance um, from that. And then I had a bonus. Um, here's the ANOVA table of results. Can you report the results like you would see in a statistical journal? Okay, this is the prompt. And then I just typed in the results. So uh, let's run my prompt. Copy. Um, now, some people have come up with this, um, this phrase. It's the AI bros. I'm going to pick chat GPT-4. The AI bros 
refer to that process I just described as prompt engineering, I think pretty soon um, companies will make prompt engineering much easier and you'll need much less experience for some tasks. Will it be statistics? I don't know. But I'm just going to run that prompt. Here's an here's a sample of our, our script. Now, uh, if I run this through chat 3.5, chat GPT 3.5, you can do this yourself. It's much faster, but I, I found that I had to tweak things a few times. So um, <laughs> I'm getting um, an almost verbatim result to uh, my own result. There are just a few small differences. We're getting uh, my prompt of making the plots, getting some simple plots. It's not using VizReg. Maybe I could go back and do that. And uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. I'm not familiar with that function. This is a new one I haven't seen. And I ran this code maybe three times in total. So I'm just going to go up here and copy this. Go back to my R script. I'm going to clear everything like I like to do. Mm -hmm. Open up a new R script. Bam. Paste it in. Now let's kind of look through this. I'm going to load up everything. It's chosen read Excel. Three, two, one. Read Excel, we should get our data popping up. Three, two, one. There it is, 17 variables. We're going to convert the data from wide to long. Three, two, one. Now we have four, nine, five, and eight. We're going to handle the missing data. Uh, now, it's made a little bit of a mistake here, at least one that I wouldn't prefer in my own professional practice, is it's creating a new um, variable removing the missing rows. So we're losing a little information here. but Nevertheless, for the sake of the argument, let's run it. Uh, we're going to run the model. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see the whole thing. It's exactly the same um, as uh, my formulation with just, just a little formatting differences. Three, two, one. Uh, so we've got our model. I'm going to show the ANOVA table just like I would do it because we loaded the LMER test. Uh, just make sure that it did do that. LMER test loaded subsequent to LMER4. The LMER function in LMER test that has the p-value calculation overwrites the LMER4 function. So I'm assuming that's not arbitrary. Let's run the model, three, two, one. Now the results are um, um, qualitatively exactly the same as mine. The numbers are a little bit different. The f value is a little smaller for parity. The p value is a little bit bigger, maybe because of that missing value. I'm just going to copy this. We can look at one of the graphs. I'm not going to belabor this. Three, two, one. Oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So we'll um, we'll have to tweak these a little bit. Not perfect, but uh, as a last little thing, what I want to do in my uh, prompt here is uh, I want to do this bonus. Here's an ANOVA table of the results. Can you report the results like you would in a statistical journal? Some of you know that I, uh, see you, James. Some of you, some of you know that I um, teach this in the old uh, stats class in the boot camp. Oops, I want to go back to chat GPT. Put that in there, and I want to go back here. I want to copy the ANOVA table. I want to see how well it does on reporting the results. Boom, boom. What I'm expecting is the degrees of freedom st uh, testing statistic and the p-value for each of the main effects be exactly like we'd see them in a journal. I want to see consistent rounding. Now it's very simplistic, it's very formulaic, but um, it 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 reports them exactly correctly. 
Now, thinking as a practitioner, um, I'd probably want to write my own result in the way that I would want to write my result. Thinking as a teacher, um, I'm thinking that I, I really can no longer have an assignment for a statistical analysis report where I ask students to report um, statistics in the technical style. Well, some students haven't encountered this before, and they, they I mean, I have in students every year that find it difficult, astonishingly, to interpret the p-value um, at the master's level. Um, it is quite surprising, but I have noticed that my whole career uh, and here at Harper. And uh, I teach the formatting of the, the minimum reporting. And uh, this this nails what I've been teaching for years. Um, so it's if some students are going to use this and others aren't, either for coding uh, or for reporting results, it's unfair unless all students are taught to use this as a tool, um, not as a crutch, as a tool. I think we're at the end of our time. Any comments on what I've shown you today? This is just scratching the surface. Um, it's all in the prompt. Any comments or questions? Thing that I see happening uh, in amongst the AI bros, but also amongst, um, amongst my colleagues here at Harper, amongst my colleagues in the special interest group, um, in uh, in uh, the Royal Statistics Society, people that I interact with uh, at uh, the um, Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and, and lots of other interesting people. You know, we're all talking about this tool. We're talking about it as a learning tool. Uh, the naive people, the people I, I judge to be naive, are like politicians and the public media are, are discussing how we can control this tool. It's already out. It's already, it's already public. Um, everybody can download this. Uh, if you have a little coding, you can already have these tools. Um, the tools are here to stay. And I, I think the only way forward is to learn how to use them to do good as fast as we can. I will be using it in every bit of teaching, every bit of research from now on. There's no going back and it's just going to get better. So we've got to end on that note. Uh, we did see the graphs. Have we used the perfect prompt plugin. No, I haven't used it yet. There are lots of prompt plugins. My approach, uh, Iona, I think that that kind of thing is going to be really powerful and I want to use it. It's only so many hours in the day and I've been having so much fun doing my own experiments to create powerful prompts um, that uh, I, ha I haven't used any prompt generators yet. I, I love seeing what I can get uh, and just how much detail is needed versus uh, versus not. What does chat GPT um, learn? Do I think we're first Sophie? Um, did we see the graphs? So we did see the graphs. Um, they, the graphs failed on the first try, but these are the worst graphs that I tried. Um, mo most of the graphs looked adequate. Sophie, do you think we're seeing democratization in access to coding? We're not seeing it yet. But this tool can definitely democratize coding for, for people that don't know how to code, but have understand the formulation of questions and answers. Of course, it doesn't, what, what I, a little caveat here, I haven't emphasized this, but um, I was able to write that prompt in five minutes because I uh, have a PhD in statistics and 20 years of experience. Uh, mileage may vary, you know, if, if if uh, you don't have the knowledge to put that into the prompt. But on the other hand, um, Iona has mentioned that um, a particular prompt plugin, uh, but I can I can tell you right now that there is already, a, if, a, if one prompt tuning plugin is a tree, there already 
is a forest of saplings. And uh, this will be a way that many of us interact. Will one emerge as dominant? Uh, pro probably not. This will this will be a, a movable feast going forward, I, I believe. Uh, and then what does ChatGPT learn from running your requests? This is a fascinating and important question. Some of the um, warnings, some of the worries people have had is that, um, and I, I think there is something to this, that uh, when you give a prompt, that the prompt itself could be used to train a further iteration of the model. It could be. But um, at the moment, the way chat GPT works is that uh, you have a very, very large training base. Um, I, I mentioned last time that it, I think of it as a very complicated regression model, uh, where a simple linear regression has two parameters, uh, the intercept and the slope. Chat GPT-4 has got uh, one trillion parameters. It's a statistical model to predict that sequence of results. Um, when you take that within a session, within an instance of uh, ChatGPT, the way that OpenAI has designed their model at the moment is that um, within one session, all of your prompts can be built up and you have a, a limit to the, the, the amount of text that that instance can remember. Um, and that limit at the moment is about 8,000 uh, 8, um, tokens, which is about 6,000 or 7,000 words in, in human language. Um, I, I take that back. It's, it's 8,000 and a whack, but it can actually remember um, 32,000, around 25,000 human words. So you can you can chain up multiple prompts, and th that's a very powerful technique. We just we just did a simple one. What it remembers then is in one session it remembers all your prompts. What people have been worried about is that the company, <laughs> OpenAI, um, wh when you sign the um, a, your user's agreement, you um, you allow OpenAI to analyze your prompts. And uh, they say that they are analyzing your prompts to learn how users are using the large language model to make it better and more ethical. And um, like what I put in their personal information or information that's that is private about other people no i wouldn't would i put in data in there that haven't been published yet well it's i probably wouldn't do that either at the moment but is is there a risk at the moment i have no idea neither does anyone else <laughs> the, i don't i don't think there's an imminent risk of uh, anything nefarious or anything like that going on the most nefarious thing that I see web companies do is uh, irritating me by taking my personal information and trying to sell me stuff. As that, that's me as an individual, I take a lot of great pains to avoid being manipulated as a consumer. But you know, I'm not a, I'm not a typical, I'm not a typical punter probably. Uh, and the way these companies view it is at a population basis. So OpenAI will have policies for prompt data use that um, that are based on a very large user base at the moment. Millions and millions of people are using this constantly. And uh, will they be learning from it? Yes, they will. Is that a bad thing? Probably it's a good thing because they're the leading company and they're, they're probably, I, I, there's no evidence whatsoever. In fact, there's lots of evidence to the contrary that they're using this to manipulate consumer behavior or doing anything other than making a better, stronger, more functional, more ethical tool. But that is a concern. It is a concern. And other companies definitely will not be as ethical as OpenAI, um, whether it's uh, companies that are working for politicians or, or 
indeed countries or political agents, maybe foreign interests for voting, misinformation, hate, um, uh, racial uh, hate. Yeah, there's a lot of potential bad stuff. We should all be worried about that. But at the moment, the thing that I am thinking about is how to use this for good. And there's a lot of good to be to be done here. What does ChatGPT learn from running your request? We don't know. And I just heard um, I just heard a uh, computer scientist, a data scientist. Now he was a director at AWS, not an academic, but um, but uh, he he said uh, not only do uh, do we not know what uh, what is happening to prompts and the data inside OpenAI and and how the large language model is working, but OpenAI or and every other person also does not know <laughs> how it works or uh, how the prompts will be used in in subsequent training. So uh, we will have to learn that in the future. Yeah, you can give feedback to the results. Another fascinating thing here. Um, it uh, it, uh, it and it can learn within a session. And at the moment, the way that all of these work is between sessions, it will forget your feedback. What what they do in the future with prompts from this round, from this particular model, will they train another big one? We don't know. What we think they're doing, I haven't even mentioned this, but I want to mention this last thing and then I'll, I'll end the video and end uh, the session, as exciting as it is, is that um, a way to extend what OpenAI say is that they do not plan to train chat GPT-5. They do not plan that at the moment. It, it costs millions of and millions of um, you know, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars or pounds in energy and in, in uh, computing time to train a new large language model. And they do not at the moment plan to do that. What are they doing instead? They're doing primarily two things, which the rest of the world is also scrambling to do. One of those two things, one of those two things is to um, <clears throat> is to uh, do experiments within the contextual memory of one session to um, to tune prompts. So for uh, the small scale fine tuning of the large language model, just like we have done in a very simple example, that's one of the things that they're doing at a large scale. And uh, an example of what this might be would be um, if, if I say, listen, can you write me a paragraph? Here are my statistical results. Can you write me a paragraph that reports these results like you would see in the journal Science? You might get one kind of output versus I could say, listen, I'm speaking to a um, a school class of year year eight kids in biology. Could you explain these results so that it would be uh, exciting for them to hear? So uh, prompting for different contexts and what, what the jargon is, the role uh, of the user or the recipient. So there, there are several roles. There's the agent, there's the user, and the recipient. Um, that's one of the active areas of research that uh, OpenAI and other com countries are doing. There's a second one, which is my last two slides, which maybe I'll do in a couple of weeks carry on with this. I, I intended to do it today, but it's such a big topic. I decided to give it its due at a future time. And that's uh, a way that um, we can expand the memory for uh, the, especially the recent or specialized memory for these large language models. So uh, chat GPT is the most slick and best working large language model. It's the only one with uh, that's been widely commercialized famously uh, through um, investment by Microsoft and also the API, which is going crazy. But um, 
it uh, it's not the biggest one anymore. There are several that are bigger um, and that are mostly experimental now. Are they better? They're not better yet. That's one way to do it, make a bigger model. And remember I said OpenAI does not plan to make a bigger model. They plan to do something different. So the other thing that they're working on and other people are working on is a way <laughs> that when you ask a question to the large language model, to chat GPT, that your question um, gets asked first to a uh, an intermediate specialized database that has been trained with um, very specialized information. It, if Iona is still here, let me just see if she is still here. You are still here. I uh, meant to mention this the last time I saw you in here, but uh, one yes, I'm here. Sorry. One case, one case that um, is an example of what I'm talking about here is what what if you wanted to write a uh, a meta analysis or an evidence based review? What if you wanted to review all those company statements for um, for modern slavery? Well, um, th there already is a mechanism to do this. I've, I've already played with it a little bit, but I'm not ready to demonstrate it, maybe in a few weeks, where you, you have a limit in the amount within a session of tokens that you can push into your model. So you, the limit would be far below um, 200 PDFs of scientific papers or um, 500 um, abstracts or 200 corporate statements on white slavery or um, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but there is a mechanism now where you can take those extraneous um, um, data sources. They're tokenized uh, in, a, in a, a data pipeline. They themselves comprise a, a database which your query is directed towards and certain information from that tokenized database are offered as the context for chat GPT. So you ask a question, uh, uh, it queries a specialized database that you design like in a, like in a meta analysis except um, much faster. And then chat GPT formulates a response to your query uh, of some kind of sentiment analysis or what have you with all of that context in a tokenized format, so relatively very small and summarized. Uh, now that that is a big deal and uh, products are already creeping into it. So those are the two next things that are happening until something else that uh, changes the playing field, which it probably will also happen. <laughs> Please I'm make it happen. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I said, please make it happen. <laughs> please make it happen. Yeah, I, it's uh, it, it's just amazing. I don't. There are ten things right now that I just want to do for fun, and I think the going forward, we as applied data scientists and statisticians, we have to just figure out uh, which one we want to go with. We can't we can't do them all. It's too exciting right now. It's too exciting. Mm, there yes. are worse worlds to live in. All right, Thank I'm going to stop the uh, yeah, you're welcome. It's been fun. Glad people are interested in this.